Mako Ichiu was coming true. The Japs couldn't seem to make mistakes. They won every war in the field and in politics. Every time they tangled with the West, they got new territory. The warlords grew more popular than ever. In 1927, one of them, Baron Giichi Tanaka, made out a secret modern blueprint to achieve this mad dream and handed it to the emperor. It is called the Tanaka Memorial, Japan's Mein Kampf. It was a simple plan, but carefully thought out. To cover the earth with a Japanese roof, the Japs had first to conquer Asia. To conquer Asia, they needed manpower and raw materials. China had the manpower. Manchuria had iron and coal. So Manchuria would be first, then China. The next step was Siberia with its vast resources of timber, coal, wheat, and metals. Then south into Malaysia and the East Indies with its fabulous empire of tin, oil, and rubber. The United States was the last step. And when the orange groves of California and the cotton fields of Alabama were part of Japan's empire, when the factories of Los Angeles and Detroit were producing for Japan's war machine, then the rest of the world would fall like a ripe plum, and the Japs would have fulfilled Jimu's divine command to cover the eight corners of the world with a Japanese roof. That was the plan, the blueprint, the specifications for a world conquest. Meanwhile, to finance the war machine, the second team, the industrialists, started their briefcase offensive. On the factories of Osaka, the mills of Tokyo, the chemical plants of Nagoya, the steel mills of Iwata, the shipyards of Nagasaki, came the economic bullets. But these belching factories in the cities were not the real machinery behind Japan's trade war. For here was the real machinery. The slums of the cities where 64% of Japan's products were made in small backroom factories employing five people or less. There are hundreds of thousands of these factories in the home where father, mother, and children work in semi-slavery. Taking advantage of these low labor costs, the industrialists of Japan knew they could undersell every other nation on earth, and they did. All over the world, they dumped their cheap labor products. And to their dumping, they added piracy. Countless patented articles were manufactured and sold throughout Asia under their American names. The two best known American spark plugs. Genuine old Scotch whiskey was made in the distilleries of Osaka. Matches made in Kobe were labeled made in Sweden. They undersold silk to the silk producing Italian. They undersold England's cotton goods in the home of her own cotton industry. They undersold beer to the beer producing Germans. American toothbrushes retailing at 35 to 50 cents each were copied in Japan to retail in American chain stores at 10 cents each. They even undersold us with our own American flag. And with the money accumulated in foreign countries with these cheap labor exports, did they in turn buy automobiles, ice boxes, or food? Did they erect better homes for the Jap workers or improve their living conditions? No, indeed. Instead, they imported oil, scrap iron, tin, rubber, aluminum, and secretly built up their powerful war machine. A fanatic nation turning its sweat into weapons for conquest. Sweat for guns. Sweat for planes. Sweat for ships. Sweat for war. The greatest weapon made in Japan was the first team product, the Japanese soldier. As iron ore is melted in furnaces to remove impurities, so in Japan, humanitarian impurities are burned out of the child. As the steel is shaped by beating and hammering, 
so is the boy, hammered and beaten into the shape of the fanatic samurai. Japanese soldier. Ready to shoot, smash, and slug Jap superiority into all non-Japanese people. And so on September 18, 1931, the first team kicked off. The warlords, faithfully following the Tanaka plan, launched their shooting war in Manchuria. Prosperity, enlightenment, justice, truth, peace, peace, peace. 